So now we're going to move from the field of biorobotics with Alon to the field of agricultural robotics with Amir. So Amir uh, did his undergrad here in mechanical engineering. Um, he did his uh, graduate degrees and his postdoc at Carnegie Mellon the Robotics Institute. So you can see there's a, a big trend here. Um, he's been a professor at the Technion since 2011 in the uh, Faculty of Civil Engineering. And he is the founder and director of the Civil, Environmental, and Agricultural Robotics Lab. Um, so without further ado. Okay, so hi everyone. So it's a great honor coming after uh, Alon here. As you mentioned, he was my advisor at CMU. I worked on medical robotics, coming back here to the Technion, starting working on field robotics in the civil and environmental engineering department. And I started working on agricultural robotics, and I'll give you about 15 minutes, um, a snippet about some of the problems in robotics and agriculture, and a bit of application. One larger example of what we did um, in the past few years. Okay, let's see if the clicker works. Perfect. Actually, nobody really talked what is robotics, and mostly we have an agreement on how we how we define a robot, although we can argue if this, if this is really the right definition, but many of us will say that robotics will have sense, think, and act. Okay, these are the three parts. And at the end, what we mostly work on and what we work on in the lab are two aspects, manipulation, moving things, and locomotion is actually moving the robot itself. They're actually dual and they're related, um, but still, most of the robots are becoming better, but still many of them fail. And one of the questions is, why do they fail? A classic example here of Asimo robot, it's quite old, but still failures like this happen quite often. And you'll see that it was failing. The interesting thing is that 10 seconds later, 5 seconds later, a few Japanese people just came in and just... Put a, put a curtain over it so nobody will see this robot. Because it's true, because uh, a successful robot, we're kind of used to it. And a failed robot, everybody wants to see what happened, and we all remember that part. And one of the reasons it failed is actually it's too complex. Part of it is also the control aspects of it, which was a bit hard to control because of the mechanical complexity and of other aspects of complexity. And you'll see the similar things in manipulation. Okay, you'll see hands which are trying to be anthropomorphically very similar to accurately to imitate what a hand is doing, and it might actually be too complex, or an agricultural robot trying to have more degrees of freedom of what it actually needs. So parts of what we do in the lab is we focus on minimalism, and in fact it's the pursuit of the least complex solution to a given task, and by doing that, we might not be as general, okay, we might not do many things that we don't need the robot to do, but we try to do it simply and robustly. So the lab works on manipulation aspects, locomotion aspects, um, working actually in the dynamic domain, actually making robots dynamic. Um, we have climbing robots, running robots, swimming robots, and God is here, did his masters on very soft and very lightweight um, robots for locomotion. We move to the field, and actually today I'll talk about parts related to field research of orchard navigation. Also on the manipulation side, we work on design of manipulators for picking fruit, and designing modular robots for picking fruit, and also designing the trees and the robots together, okay, to actually optimize picking robots. Okay, so not only see the tree, design the robot, or see a robot, design a tree, but simultaneously doing both of them. So today I'll talk about um, locomotion in orchards, but I want to talk a few minutes about how the world will be in about 30 years. So many of you know the statistics that population is growing really fast and will have about a growth of at least 25% um, relative to today. The demand for food will increase, not only food, but other products for textile will increase by around 70% by 2050. And we'll have a shortage 
of ground and water supply, and one of the most interesting things of labor working for agriculture. So we must increase productivity in um, agriculture productivity by at least 25% to actually meet the demand. So we'll do it by a few ways, and I'll talk about it, but of course I'll focus on using ag robotics, agricultural robotics, once again, manipulation aspects, and locomotion. So a bit more statistics. These are different, um, the number of workers in different fields in agriculture, from citrus, orchards, greenhouses, vegetables, then flowers, and open field crops. And this is the output, okay? How much output each one of these fields. And one thing you can see is the yellow part, which you'll see only a few workers and lots of output. Okay, and this is for, mostly in Israel, it's mostly wheat, some corn, some cotton. And how do we reach this amazing feed of only a few workers and such large output? And of course, we all know the answer. It's all mechanization, right? So this combined and other specific machines helps us for more, almost 100 years to get this output of only a few workers and so much output. But what we're missing is having all this not only in open fields, but actually in orchards, okay, or in greenhouses. And this is where we are trying to reach. Another aspect, which I want you to understand very quickly, you can do a whole course on something that is called precision agriculture. Usually, typical, typical farmers, once a year, looked at a whole field and made their decisions from one time, once per season. Okay. I have this much output on this field, I might need to water it differently. I might need to fertilize it differently. What you want to do in precision ag is to look at the field in much higher resolution. It might be a square meter, even less, and it might be in a spatial time of once a day or once a week. So once every week, the farmer will get, a, get information and have a decision-making system Tell them, listen, there are areas which are not watered enough, or there are areas where you want to fertilize it more, or there might have some pests, so you'll need some pesticide to work only on a specific place. And this is happening these days in the field and in open fields, and usually the sensors are coming usually from satellites, sometimes from airplanes or drones. But what we're missing out is that we don't have enough precision ag inside of orchards. And why is that? Well, first of all, what do we need? We want to sense the ground. We want to sense the fruit. How much fruit? What is the volume? What is the output? Maybe pests. And later on, we'll want to understand that only this tree and a specific area of the tree has more pests, so we can spray and fertilize or pesticide differently for different trees. Okay? And of course, we want to do these manipulation tasks. We want to harvest. We want to spray and so on, and want to do that precisely, and we don't have that. And in order to do that, we'll most likely need a ground vehicle to do that. And not only a ground vehicle, but a ground vehicle that will know how to localize very, very accurately. Okay? So, our task, and I'll focus on that for the next five or so minutes, our task is to patrol this orchard, okay, something like that, and not only patrol and not only do row following, understand that you need to go up and go down and so on, but if I stop the vehicle, I want it to know exactly where it is. If I reset the robot and move it to a different place, I will also want the robot to know where it is. So kind of an intro, and some of you have learned these basic concepts and techniques. You can look at wheel odometry, count how much the wheels are turning, and from that, you can see that this Fork shape is really messy. It's not a fork shape anymore. Okay? So you can see that this is a very bad result of just using wheel odometry. You can use other techniques like iterative closest point, ICP, and once again, not working very well. Things become better when you start integrating a few sensors together. And here we use extended Kalman filter, EKF, and we also use IMUs together with other sensors. Much better but you can still see that the starting and end positions 
which are supposed to be exactly the same, are 15 meters apart. It's not really precise agriculture. Okay, you stop, and it's, the tree might be very far away to where you want it to be. You might ask, what about GPS, right? The tractors in the field use GPS. In orchards, we typically do not want to use GPS. Usually, they're not accurate, although the GPS systems we use are very, very um, with high resolution, we can actually get centimeter level when we're outside. We use things called differential GPS or RTK GPS, which many use, but they don't work as well in the orchards. So we're trying to see how we can use other aspects. Another option is to use the distance sensor, LIDARs. We have simple sensors on all our robots measuring distance to obstacles, but the problem here is that the scenery, if you look at the trunks of the trees, and you put the robot here, it will see a few trunks, right? If you move the robot, or the robot moves, it will see a similar scene here, because the, the scene is homogeneous here, then we have this problem of not really knowing where we are globally. So here the problem is, is that life is a bit, is quite nice, we engineered the orchard, but it's also quite problematic, because everything looks the same. So our solution here is to go up to the sky and use a drone um, for a very simple mission. Right now, it's just looking at this lovely almond um, orchard in Kibbutz Levi, looking from about 80 meters high down, following the robots, and I'll show that in a few minutes, following the robots, and now you can see that for these trees, things now look not very homogeneous, right? They're not symmetric anymore. So taking this high over shot, looking down, suddenly things look different, and we can use this map from a high altitude image, and also use a lower altitude image of following this ground vehicle to actually localize the robot. And this is work done by Omar Shalev, a master's student, who is now um, soon to be starting his PhD in my lab. So we have a few robots, one of the reasons I didn't bring one here. Well, this one weighs about a ton. Okay, it's quite big. Um, we typically don't use it. It's usually easier to use one of our smaller robots. And, and most of the um, experiments I'll show here is actually using the Jackal robots. So we have a few hours in the field. I'll show in a few minutes of all the experiments we were doing here. So the idea here is to use a low altitude drone. It might be tethered. It might actually be just a mass looking down. We'll also have a higher altitude, but only once a day, or opportunistically, okay? You might want to see once in a while the robot loses its way, so the, robot, the aerial vehicle will go up to the sky, take a snapshot, and help the ground vehicle navigate and localize itself. So these are types of images we have, and I'll skip over most of the details, but at the end, what we want to achieve is this map of, first of all, having these contours, and I'll talk why we want these contours, and we also want to semantically label and represent this orchard. Okay, so mostly it's quite easy computer vision um, aspects here of how to find these contours, but the nice thing is it's very robust, and even in different times of day, still the contours look quite similar, although the shades and other aspects change quite a bit. So we really need these to be robust and accurate in order to be able to use these scans of contours from looking from above. Okay, the next part is actually finding the, the trees and understanding that this, these are two different trees and not correctly and mistakenly thinking that they're actually one tree. At the end, we have an algorithm that finds and actually gives a name to each one of the trees. Later on, we'll be able to give the robot the option to go from one tree to another, and we'll actually know where it is and what tree it's actually looking at. And the idea of using these contours is before I told you that when I look at the trunks, everything looks the same. But now imagine that I'm going up a few meters high, and suddenly I'm looking at these contours of, of the canopies. Now things are a bit better. So we use ray tracing techniques of going around and seeing where, when I'm hitting um, the obstacles, and we can do this in real time, and we can also actually do this virtual scan, because it's not really scanning it, it's from the ground, 
but it's scanning on this projection from the image to the ground. Doing that, now we can start using techniques that many others use for localization. For instance, the Monte Carlo localization techniques, which is a particle filter technique. I'll explain in 10 seconds. It's a bit more complicated. The idea here is, if I have this scan here, where am I here? Okay. So now what we do is we spread out many particles, and we ask each one of these particles, what is the probability of you seeing this scan? Okay. So it gives a probability. We have some other aspects of it, of actually having a motion model, adapting, and then actually doing some, um, taking that action, taking that model of motion, and then converging this cloud, and hopefully, after a while, we'll convert to a small cloud, and I'll know, you know what, this is where I am, this is the scan, and this is the position and orientation of the robot. Okay, so this method now, will compare it between the canopies looking from above, and the trunks from the ground. And I'll show you a simulation of this. The green instance, the green particles, are going to be the canopies particles. The brown ones are the trunks. And you'll see here that the green canopies will converge to one single cloud, even when it goes under the tree. So it diverges a bit and then converges back. While the trunks one, it makes sense that they won't really know where it is. Like I said before, all the trunks look the same. Okay, so I'm skipping over some details of how we synthesize this, but we take many different, um, a few different plots in different times of seasons. Actually, we took it in November and April, showing the robustness of using different um, types of plots and different shots like this. We took different types of trajectories. We added noise to our sensors to see how noise and how robust um, this system is. We use a few metrics that we invented, which are quite intuitive. For instance, how many of the trials converge to a centimeter level accuracy? How long did it take us to converge? If it converged and then went out, how much of the time? What we call the in-band rate, and so on. We have many, many of these tables. I'm not going to go into depth in these, but at the end, as you can imagine, things succeeded when we were using these canopies instance for the Monte Carlo localization. In fact, the conversion rate was almost perfect when you compare it to the trunk, which was around 66%. The time that we were inside the centimeter level was also much better um, using our method, and it was much quicker to actually convert here. So we were able to represent the orchard in a simple way, a comp compact representation that we can use also later for these Monte Carlo localization. I didn't go into it, but we can do path planning now that we have this representation of the orchard. Okay, so this was kind of a snippet of one of the projects we do in the lab. We work on many different aspects. We have underground robots um, working on actually um, making tunnels underground. We have aerial robots like you saw, and some of them are for agriculture, some of them are for construction and site planning. But here, I try to show you the importance, and it was just really a snippet of it, the importance of using robots for agriculture. And I show specifically for orchards, talking about precision ag. And here, I showed you a specific um, example of localization inside orchards, where we saw the difference between a continuous robot from above looking at the ground robot, kidnap robot problem, which I didn't mention, but when we were able to do this, we could take the robot and actually move it to a different place, had global localization, even if I reset the, pro the, the robot, and this is what we call the kidnap robot. We kidnap it, move it to a different place, and it need to actually localize itself once again. Other aspects that we're doing, other uses of drones, and other uses of aerial and ground collaboration for site. Okay, so thank you very much.